Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist, and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Today I have with me Patricia Sullivan, the author of Overland Before the Hippie Trail, Kathmandu and Beyond, with a van, a man, and no plan. Tricia, welcome. Thank you, Becky. You spent a lot of time on the road. Can you tell us, like, how long did you wait, or did you wait, before you started to put your travel story into a manuscript with the idea of publishing it? Well, it actually started back in 2009, when I had moved to Berkeley, didn't know anybody. I just retired. Well, I knew my daughter here, her family, just retired boxes all over the house and including boxes that had these journals in them. And a few months after that, I got breast cancer and was stuck in the house for a whole year with chemo, radiation, surgery, all of those things. And the end of that, which was the beginning of oh, the end of a wait, I thought, I've got to change my life. I've got to do something. I've got to turn over a new leaf. Yeah. And at that point, I pulled out. I said, in January, I'm going to start something new. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started going through reading for the first time um, all the journals that I had kept, the trip log I had kept, the photographs, and, and the letters that both my husband, Mick, and I had written. Yeah. And I wanted to just put them in order, just make a sense of those two years that it happened 50 years earlier. Yeah. Wow. So, and th- that took me about five years. Wow. I was doing mm-hmm. other things. It was not full time, yeah. <laughs> but in 2015, I did publish, well, I didn't publish, but I put together a manuscript in book form. Mm-hmm. And I, I knew this was way too much. I put everything in there. Oh, wow. Every yeah. day, everybody we saw, every everything I could think of and everything I read about not just think of, but the things I had written down. Yeah. And I knew it was way too much for anybody except maybe my kids, maybe my grandkids, and maybe not even them. Yeah. Then when it really started was COVID, 2020. Uh, okay, yeah. Being in the house, I thought, okay, this is the time that I can go through the book and try to make it something more interesting for people I, besides my family. Yeah. Did you find as you were going through the journals and photos and everything that you started to remember more about the the moments that happened that you hadn't maybe specifically written down, but because you'd lived that experience, did you find that it stirred up a lot of memories along the way? It did, exactly. And not only with me, but my husband, who I'm still with, had not read the journals either. But I would say something to him like, oh, do you remember... I wrote about that we were in this place and did this thing. And he would say sometimes, oh, yeah, and I remember this. Oh, yeah. So t- together we we had some good conversations and that he remembered things I didn't remember and vice versa. Yeah. So I didn't put all those in because I wanted to, in the book because I wanted to stick to mostly to the data. But it mm-hmm. did the data that had been written. Yeah. But yes, it did remind me of a lot and... I was able to put more emotion into it oh, by nice. talking mm-hmm. about it yeah. during that process. Wow. And how many journals are we talking about? I mean, I know it was a long period of time, so it was about two years, right? But It was two years. Yeah. Well, I kept a journal every few days, and, and Mick also kept a journal every few days. So we each had one or you know, a couple of books worth. Mm-hmm. But the main thing that I ended up relying on was my trip log which mm-hmm. is one book, and every single day I wrote in that book where we, what the day was, where we slept, where we ate, or where we what we bought, or including like stamps. Or I mean, I was down to the penny. Wow, wow! <laughs> and I translated it all into American money, even though we were using all kinds of different money. But to keep it consistent, I translated it to American money. So I have some things. Oh, this cost twelve cents, or mm-hmm. This day we spent $5. That was a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but when I read that 
daily journal, I could remember more than just reading the trick log. Let me see and remember the days more clearly than the journals. Now, when you started out, when you first headed off, did you and started writing this this travel log? Did you have an in what was your intention since you were so diligent? Did you have what was your intention in keeping such a precise log? I didn't start out with the intention of writing mm-hmm. a book at all. I've been I think I grew up with my mother keeping journals, my grandmother keeping journals, reading. I started keeping a journal when I was about 12. So I think it's just something I like to do. It helped me remember. Mm -hmm. And why I began so detailed in this, I'm really not sure. But I'd like to keep records. Yeah. I guess that's... (laughs) (laughs) I think that's great. I also think it's great that that you and Mick are, uh, that you're still together, that you, you know, your relationship is strong after the challenges and joys of this kind of living on the move with, very few things, you know, we get so used to having things in this world, right? Right. right. <laughs> and that, that here you are 60 years together, I think is what you'd said, right? Yeah, from 65, we got married in 1965. Yeah, yeah. So close to that. That's inspiring in itself. That's great. <laughs> well, I guess it is kind of unusual. Yeah. I have some friends that are also been married this long uh-huh. <laughs> that have traveled <laughs> So do th- yes, it's it's nice to have a partner. Yeah, that it goes back that many years. And I can we can remember things that happened back in the sixties. Yeah, would you say that the travel experience in those early years and your marriage strengthened your relationship? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, we had dated for several years in college, but as my daughter said, "You mean, mom, you didn't even live together?" <laughs> and, <laughs> no. Back in the 60s, we did not live. We had not lived together. Right. We set out on this trip in 1965, six weeks after getting married. And I thought I knew him, but I didn't. You know, I hadn't lived with him. Yeah. Wasn't quite a partner. But over those couple of years, yes. Yeah. We were, as I said in one of my letters, we were rarely out of arm's reach mm. for the, basically those two years. Yeah. Wow. Sitting in a, mostly in the car, in the van. <laughs> or where we were traveling. Yeah. So yeah, we we had a few rough moments mm-hmm. in the beginning, just trying to get get used to each other. Sure. But then yeah. we became very very close. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about some of the sort of the the details of your book. Tell us a little bit more about the title, if you would. The title took me months and months. I I went through a lot of titles, but I I ended up with this title that I'm happy with because it it says all the main things. Mm-hmm. The word overland, yes, we were in a van. A lot of people travel by plane most of the time now in Europe, in Asia. But this was all the time in a van. Before the hippie trail, I was important because the hippie trail was basically during the 1970s and mostly involved going to Nepal or India for the drugs, mm-hmm. for Nirvana, Mm -hmm. for the adventure. I didn't know anything about drugs and I didn't come across drugs. I mean, there obviously there were, there was hashish along the way, but I didn't know it. And the Kathmandu and beyond is important because Kathmandu was a a center point of where we were traveling, where we sold the car. Mm -hmm. We didn't Mm -hmm. sell the car in Kathmandu, we sold it in Kabul, Afghanistan. But from Kathmandu on, we were in public transportation which changed the travel completely from being in our own van and deciding where we would sleep and where we'd drive, where we'd take. All of that stopped once we sold the car. So it was completely different travel when we went beyond Kathmandu to the rest of India and Southeast Asia and East Asia. Mm, yeah. And then the van, the man and no plan. Actually, it was my daughter-in-law who said, this is it, a van and but she she said a little bit differently. I changed it somewhat, but I thought, yeah, okay, there's a van. And some people say, why isn't it called a man, a van, and no plan? But this <laughs> is not about a man. I wanted to make sure that there was a man. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but it was basically that we had our van. We were together and we were traveling without any real idea of where we were going. Yeah. That's a, a nice 
distinction that you made there in terms of the, you know, what your focus on the book was and how your subtitle, just that little bit of arranging of the words, you know, makes a difference in how we might think about. It. Yeah, so that's brilliant. Tell me a little bit about the cover image. Well, the cover, as you've seen, either you've seen the book or listened to it, shows our van. It's our actual van. And the road going off into the distance, which I think is important. There's nothing except bare hillsides, so you can imagine where this kid van is going. But I took that picture. I took a, that's a portion of a larger picture. Off the picture is Mick, and he's standing by the sign that says sea level, and it's above the top of the van. So we're <laughs> driving. This is in Jordan. We're going down to the Dead Sea, and Mick is up on the top with the sign that says sea level at this point. I took that picture off because I didn't want a man on the cover. I had seen several books about travel and they've all been by men, about men, and women were secondary. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. but but I think it's it would be fun to show the picture that this is really on the way down to the Dead Sea yeah. in Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> great, great. Back when I first started the idea of publishing the book, I did think the only way to get publishing, to get something published was to find a company that would publish your book. And I wrote out some, I wrote some letters, I made some stabs, I got some responses, but it all seemed to take, it was going to take like two years or a long time. And it was a friend of mine who said, do you know about BEPA? And I said, what's BEPA? And she said, you got to go to their meeting. It's next week. And so I did. BEPA is the Bay Area Independent Publishers Association. I could not have published this book without the help of all of the people in BEPA who gave me advice from the very beginning when I didn't really know at all what I was doing. And now I know so much more. But without this, I couldn't have done it. So thanks to the Bay Area Independent Publishers Association for all the help. And a side note that the website for BAPA is B-A-I-P-A dot org and meets on Zoom. So it's accessible to people who whether they're in the Bay Area or not. Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. Getting your memoir into audio can be a delicate process, best treated with a nurturing and supportive approach. Many authors assume that when a memoir is recorded, it needs to be in the author's voice. And while sometimes that is best, it is not always the best option. At Pro Audio Voices, we'll work through that decision with you and support you in the production process whichever way you choose. If you decide to narrate, we set you up for success with a range of options. From having an audio engineer and director on the line for every recording session, to getting you properly set up for recording on your own. If we hire a professional narrator, we'll make sure the voice is the right fit for you and your memoir. At Pro Audio Voices, your story is important to us. Let's inspire the world together. Let's talk a little bit about the audiobook aspect of production for you. And so when it came to narration, you had several voices to choose from. And I'm I'm wondering if you can articulate what drew you most to the voices of Margie Valine and Nathan Agan. Well, I think that Pro Audio did an excellent job, first of all, of going through, I don't know how many voices they did go through, but all of the ones that I was presented, I think it was six, seven or eight for the female voice, they were all good. It was a very, mm. very hard decision to choose one. I listened and listened and listened. Yeah. Run it down to like three, <laughs> listen yeah. some more. Because I felt this was very important to to not only listen to somebody for like a half an hour, maybe like you might do on a newscast or something or a short mm-hmm. short audio, but for maybe ten hours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how could I could I stay with this as a listener? Did I think I could listen to this person for ten hours? Mm-hmm. Uh, I had listened to other not not this book, but other podcast or something. And after after a while, I thought, I get tired of that voice. And I thought Margie's was a good one to listen to for that length of time. And she, she, she was very comforting, I thought, in her, in her presentation, and yet showed excitement and energy. And Nathan also, there were fewer, 
fewer male voices. And again, it was the same process. Hard to choose, but I liked the enthusiasm that he gave. Yeah, great. In his voice. And so then in reviewing, you know, when it came time to like hear your whole story in the voice of Margie and Nathan, but, you know, in someone else's voice, how was that for you? I know that that can be it's it's a question I love to hear, you know, how different authors respond to that. Yeah, it was terrible. (laughs) 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 Well, that's not right. Quite the word, but it was very hard for me to listen to her and to him saying, I, I did this, Mm -hmm. I did that, when I knew that wasn't me, and it wasn't my voice, and it's someone acting Mm -hmm. like me, it was, it was kind of a shock to, to hear it. And first of all, I wanted to think, no, no, that's not how I would say it, or that's not right. But it wasn't her, it was me thinking that, and and I got used to it. Uh And nobody else knows that. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. The rest of us sounds, you know, <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's an interesting thing because, of course, our voices are so unique to each of us. And while many people can sound like someone else, you know, there is a, you know, we even just think about voice recognition systems. Clearly, there are different, you know, we have very unique voices. And even the fact that we hear ourselves differently than other people hear us because we're hearing it our own voices through the the bones in our head and whether it's live like that or in a recording we think about oh when i hear myself recorded i don't sound like i think i do so i find it it's a really fascinating process and aspect yeah i am very happy with the way marky yeah. read and um not that she pretended to be me but it works yeah what would you say, is there anything about the process of producing the audiobook in the first place, just the production process overall, which I believe was new for you? Is there anything about that process that stands out to you that you'd like to share? One thing is that I noticed, I realized that I'm really glad that I didn't try to do this myself. I didn't realize how hard it would be, how long it would take, not only getting the equipment I didn't have, yeah, the microphones I didn't have, a sound you know, I could not have done it myself, but I didn't know that. I didn't know how how many pieces there were to put that this would that would make up this production. So I'm very glad to Pro Audio doing it this way. It was not hard doing it. It was I mean it made it very easy. Pro Audio made it very easy to work. So I know when we first chatted about your book before we got into the production aspect, I had asked you this question. I'm going to ask now. Is like what would you what do you hope readers, listeners will take away from the experience of being with your your story? Well, I hope they have a good adventure. I hope people feel like they've gone on this trip so many years ago and and that it kind of unfolds as the book as I take them from Europe all the way through Asia to the end of the continent, to the end of the landmass in Japan. So there's the adventure part, but I also hope that it reminds them what life was like for travelers and for others mm-hmm. in the pre-digital age, especially people who hadn't right. lived in the 60s or the 70s or hadn't traveled at that time, because it was such a different world then, not only for us, but the way we traveled and the countries that we traveled through, there have been so many changes. Of course, there are always changes. Yeah. So I, I hope that people will will get a good sense of, of what the world was like for us then and how kind people were. We were not afraid. I I don't remember being afraid, really, of things. You hear so much, there's so much othering now of the world, but I didn't feel that. I felt that we were meeting people who were opening up to us as we opened up to them all over the world, whether we had much language or not. So I hope those ideas of the world being open to everybody to learn and meet new people and get a different idea, a new person of themselves. That's beautiful. Thank you. Your comment about how we tend to other people as (laughs) well-made. And how can listeners learn more about you and your writing and anything else that you may have to offer? Well, the main thing would be my website, which is patriciansullivan.com. Got to put the N in there, Patricia N. Sullivan. On the website, there are some photographs that are in the book. Uh Uh-huh. Maybe some photographs that no, I guess the I guess I didn't put any photographs in the not in the book, though I have many. And a few little things that I've written. One little 
little thing I found as I was looking through old records is this, my 12-year-old little story about my pet monkey that died, which is one of the first things I remember, one of my first memoirs. And that is because my mother, when I was so sad, this little pet died, my mother said, why don't you write a story about the life of Judy? Judy was the name of my monkey. And so I did. So that was my first memoir. And there's a little piece of it on my website. Nice. Now, I think that you mentioned to me at one point that you have travelers who have reached out to you about their own travels in relation to your book. Is that so? I was very surprised at this. So many people, and it continues to happen just about two days ago. Again, it happened. Somebody, and this is a friend of a friend. I'm past the friends and to the trends of the friends. <laughs> and you've got some unknown people from, this is a couple from Montana that I don't know, but that ran across this by chance, who say, I loved your book because it's all the adventures in it and because I did the same uh, thing. I or I felt the same thing or I, I ran across some desert life or meeting people, or whatever yeah. it is. They tell me about their adventures and their experiences from maybe the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, anytime. Yeah. So, so I'm glad that this book seems to bring out memories from other people that, that they have not written. And many people said to me, have said to me still, I wish I had written my stories, but I didn't have the data for one thing. I, did, I started out keeping a journal, but I didn't finish mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And that's the reason I could write this is that I had kept those journals and those notes. You can't rely on 50-year-old right. memories. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, Yeah. We just, yeah, we don't remember things. I have also have a lot of experiences and reading journals from when I'm in my 20s or, or, you know, whenever. And I'm so struck by how the ways I remember things differently at this point than if I go back and read. And I was, oh, very enlightening. It's pretty so, common. Yeah, yeah. So, and then what's your aspiration w either with this moving forward or what's what's next for you? And, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on this audiobook right now. Yeah. <laughs> with you. <laughs> yes. I'm not planning mm -hmm. to write another book, but I may. Well, I don't know if I'll write yeah. another book. I might write more small, more incidents from other travel. This book, of course, ends in 1967. I've done a lot of traveling since 1967 with a lot of adventures. And some I have written about, like uh, short stories or short articles. But I may and do more of that, bring out more of the experiences in China, for instance, or Vietnam or Turkey. Yeah, I think that would be Or great. other places. That would be great. I'm sure that a lot of us would love to read about those. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time joining me today. A reminder, so if you'd like to learn more, you can go to patricianesullivan.com. And Trisha, thank you so much for taking this time with me. Thank you, Becky. And thank you, Pro Audio, for all the work you do. It's great. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.